timing, and I think things are clearly hotting up, certainly in this country on the European debate, but not just in this country. You know, you have a, you're a skeptic uh, party emerging, the Professors' Party, alternative for Germany, uh, in Germany, uh, and across Europe. This is more of a global trend now, you're a skeptic and concern about where the EU is heading. Um, I'm here, I think, probably to add a bit of controversy, or perhaps a lack of democracy, uh, dip diplomacy to the proceedings, uh, because I'm someone that actually believes in leaving the European Union. Uh, I've just come back from Iceland uh, over the last few days. I've been visiting there, meeting the future Prime Minister. They're likely to break off EU accession talks very shortly. Um, the, the, the new anti-EU government, uh, coalition government, is forming at the moment. Um, <clears throat> But really, my belief is that um, you know, we need a different model with the EU for this country, particularly uh, along the lines of the EEA, uh, the uh, European Economic Area, as you know it well, I'm sure, Norway and Iceland, uh, or perhaps closer to the Swiss model, which is far more flexible, a different relationship with the European Union. And that's what I really stand on. But it's interesting what's happened is it's suddenly become respectable to uh, have these views, these uh, reactionary views of leaving the EU. I used to feel it was rather lonely, a rather lonely vigil to be promoting these views, and now I seem to be, there seems to be standing room only uh, with uh, Lord Lawson and Michael Gove and Michael Patillo and Philip Hammond just in the last week, and there's up to nine British cabinet ministers rumoured to believe leaving the European Union. But along the lines, you know, I do support the Prime Minister's policy. I think it's a good policy of uh, attempting to renegotiate with the EU. And if that is not acceptable, then to go to the out vote, the out option. But, you know, this is all shades of grey. Uh, it's not the 50 shades of grey, I hate to add, but it is shades of, shade of grey in the sense that, you know, if you're talking EEA, you're not very far away um, from where renegotiation might take us within the EU. Um, you know, for example, it doesn't have justice and home affairs, we're about to opt out of that under the Lisbon Treaty this country is, um, and the EEA members do not have justice and home affairs. They, of course, relevant to today, they, they're not opting in to foreign affairs and defence, so immediately if we were to join the EEA, we would actually uh, leave the EAS behind. I, I don't think that would actually be a huge loss, I have to say. Um, <coughs> But ladies and gentlemen, um, I do regard what is happening with the European Union as extremely serious. Um, and I do feel we've now en en ended what I call an end game. Um, but whilst the Treaty of Rome made it clear that the ultimate destination was ever closer union, we now have, and they've sort of broken cover now, the Federalists, um, we have the President of the Commission, Barroso, talking about a federal union. He's writing a paper on it at the moment. Uh, we have the Eurozone uh, countries coming together and talking of economic and fiscal union, as well you know. Um, and even the cautious Angela Merkel is now talking of the political union, a political union. And it's no wonder that William Hague has had to send out a missive around British embassies a warning of um, competence creep, as it's called, uh, of the EAS, because you know their their ultimate destination, in my view, is to create a super state, uh, and you know where we're headed, and I don't think there's any doubt on the destination. If you're especially speaking as a member of the European Parliament, you see it every day. The ultimate destination, honestly, is the United States of Europe, a single country called Europe. Um, and the real choice for Britain, in my view, therefore, is not between the status quo, and I think the status quo will be on offer, and the Prime Minister is right on that. We cannot be in this sort of semi-detached position uh, with opt-outs in various places, like with the Euro, like Denmark, Denmark and Britain have opted out. Um, no, because you know a lot of these countries, a lot of, more of the 27 are meant to join the Euro, which would actually only leave Britain outside with Denmark when it comes to all this Eurozone legislation which has been driven forward and it become increasingly clear that we'll be on the outer ring of the European Union. So the real choice is between joining this political union, which is the ultimate destination, as a subservient state or leaving the EU and uh, 
negotiating a trade only or pretty much a trade only relationship, as I say, like the EAA, uh, like the uh, Swiss model. But I would say something I actually I'm going to promote in a book this year is an EEA light option, which is somewhere between Norway and Iceland and Switzerland. It's a more flexible version because you know the trouble with the EEA is you have to sign up to a lot of EU legislation. But as the future, hopefully the future Prime Minister of Iceland was saying, you know, you can influence that, infl uh, uh, that legislation at an early stage. They don't have many problems with it, and they save an awful lot in membership fees. Um, and I think that is where Britain is, is going. And I think the topics that you're touching on today, the Eurozone crisis, are obviously fundamental to this, and the common foreign, foreign security policy pushing that forward. And this parliamentary sub-chamber, which I find rather scary, the idea of having a kind of inner core, which goes with this inner uh, uh, super-state ari arising, uh, they're running forward, you see, to force integration together, political integration, and countries like Britain will be left on the outside, and our choice will then be, well, do you want, do you want to join this political super-state, or would you want to be left outside, you know? Um, but, um, it, it, I mean, I feel very strongly about this because, you know, you, many uh, represent countries here, you're, you're ambassadors, and it is countries that have embassies, and it is countries that have foreign ministers, um, and armies, and flags, and anthems, and single currencies. And the EU has all of those now. And on that point, on the point of the, the single currency, let's be clear that the euro was and always has been a political currency. And that in many ways is why it's got in such mess. It's designed to force political integration, political integration, um, and at some massive economic cost. And that is why Greece was allowed to join in the first place, because, uh, I mean, Greece was way over the top in terms of master criteria. Um, I think it was actually about four times the master criteria was over the top at the time, but they turned a blind eye to that because the real objective was political integration. And actually what's happening in terms of rushing forward this fiscal and political union is about seizing the opportunity, turning a crisis into an opportunity, um, to actually create this super state. Um, I think, ladies and gentlemen, just to say that my fear in all is that the EU is very ruthless in its aims and it will tolerate social unrest, democratic outrages, you know, it appointed the Prime Minister of Greece, it appointed the Prime Minister of Italy, these unelected commissioners like Mr. Van Rompuy, they appointed uh, people to lead nation states and that was a very dangerous um, uh, road to go down. And I think it has led to economic ruin and personal misery right across Europe and when you have 60% youth unemployment, which is what you're hitting now in Spain and Greece, then you might be on the edge, God forbid, of, of revolution and, and the return of military governments in those countries. I think this is a disastrous uh, state of affairs. And as I say, the ultimate objective is United States of Europe. But perhaps today, with the publication of the EU referendum bill, we might at last be looking at a different alternative. Thank you. Mark Campbell thank you very much. Uh, we'll open uh, to your questions in just a few moments, but just uh, let's have a few more words from our panel. All pretty gloomy in your own way. Just uh, Gideon Rackman, the picture we're given there of the state of Europe and the, the misery that everyone, Mark Campbell would have us believe, is going through at the moment. Is that. Well, it's, it's pretty bad. I mean, I, I, I don't. I think he's uh, right to raise the prospect of actually the loss of democracy of Spain and Greece. Uh, that's not my impression, but uh, who knows? These things, these things are unpredictable. But my sense is that democracy is pretty safe in those countries. I also, um, I think that uh, in, in some ways, he, uh, if I can respond to the points about the British debate, I, I can see um, where you're coming from. It seems to me that you're a bit too gloomy about Britain's ability to stay out of the, political, the drive for political union. Um, your assumption is that the Eurozone will actually stay together 
and that it will kind of drag everything towards it as a kind of magnetic force, and that the option that, for example, Cameron got, which is not to join the fiscal pact, uh, will, will not be sustainable. Uh, now, and I agree with you that every country bar us in Denmark is formally, legally pledged to join the euro. But there's actually not much sign that they're going to. I mean, again, I was in Poland. They, they, the, that's the position. The Polish government will say, yeah, we're going to join the euro. And then you actually look. 30% you know, of their public want to join. They have to amend their constitution in a way that's going to be pretty well impossible. Uh, so I don't think they're going to join anytime soon. The same with the, same with the Swedes, actually. They're formally... Uh, pledged to join the euro, but they had a referendum and they lost. And there's no prospect, I think, of them doing it. So I think actually the idea of there being two clubs, an in club and an out club, uh, is more, I wouldn't write it off for now. You may be right, ultimately, it will all turn into one kind of federal super state, but it doesn't seem to me that the path to that is, is, abs is, is, is far from clear that they're going get, to get there. And it seems to me, therefore, premature for the Brits to say, oh, well, it's clearly going that way, we're out. Uh, I think there's a long game to play, and the British need to stay in there for now. But if there is an in-club and an out-club, which some argue there might well be, why, you refer to a sub-chamber as scary, why are you so scared of that? Well, the powers of sub-chamber have, as I understand it, is that they can overrule difficult single states, uh, nation states, such as probably Britain. <coughs> Um, overrule that and you know what this is all about it seems to me that the eurozone whether it's the eurozone consolidating politically the, the nations of the eurozone through the fiscal union because you know fiscal economic union you are almost at the political union stage you see what the arguments the other way around with Alex Salmon is you know the idea his campaign is falling apart because you know, he wants the Bank of England to, to set his interest rates. You know, that's economic and fiscal union in reverse. I mean, I just see this as, uh, you know, the the inner core parliamentary assembly, which would, I don't know quite how it would work with the European Parliament, but this is all about driving integration, having an inner core that others will be forced <coughs> to either join or to seek a different relationship with. I think in a way, ironically, the EU is leaving us rather than us leaving them. And that's what's going on at the moment. I would say just on the dangers, uh, I mean, the CIA website, I understand, has predicted uh, a possible return of generals in 